G'day guys, welcome to uh, Life on the Mold Q&A number one. It'll probably be one of many, uh, given um, the amount of questions I've, I've got ahead of me right now. I've got around 25 questions. Um, I probably have had a lot more over the, the course of the series, but uh, what is evident, there's a lot of questions out there that I'm not answering as I'm going ahead with the series. So hopefully I can sort of uh, dispel a couple of the the myths and the questions that are being asked and, and sort of put those to bed so that we can move forward. I think what is evident is that uh, as I go through the build series and I'm, I'm building the boat and I'm editing the videos and I'm, I'm trying to make it interesting and, and, and by the same token I'm also showing you uh, sections at a time but I'm never quite showing you the complete picture of the, the completed boat or uh, what my vision is I guess, I guess that I'd call it my vision. Um, and, on, and ultimately the, uh, the completed craft, uh, which I do have photos of a sail version and a power cat version of my craft. So I guess at the end of the day, um, a Q&A um, video is, is definitely uh, timely because as I head further into it, you know, we're going to get more and more detailed into bulkheading and, and inserting modules and the like. And uh, yeah, I, I'm going to get fairly uh, uh, stretched, I guess, as far as, um, you know, doing these Q&A. So now's, now's a good time. And, and to be honest, the, the questions have come through at a very good time because it's it's helping me to put things into place so that going forward, you guys as uh, as loyal subscribers and, uh, and and viewers of my channel, which I, I just cannot believe that there's seven and a half thousand of you out there that are even remotely interested. And I keep saying that because it, it just blows me away that, uh, you know, people are happy to sit and watch me work. And you seem to have a pretty good time watching me work and having a beer while I'm uh, sweating my box off up there in the, in the mould. So I was going to do it up on the actual hull and sit up there, but the, the reality is I need a PC in front of me where I can I can sort of see the questions. And I'm going to put the questions up on the screen so you can see them and uh, and full accolade to the people who coined the questions to me because uh, some of them are very very good. So. The first question I have from uh, Mark Pavey in California. Oh, and before I go on, funnily enough, all of you guys with your YouTube handles, uh, I have no idea what most of your names are because there's some pretty profound names there. So if I miss your name or I, I can't quite work out who you are, then uh, I apologize. But if you send a question, would you mind just putting your actual name on there because it helps me a little bit put a, put a, a I guess, a fictional face to the, uh, to the uh, said question. So Mark Pavey in California, and his question is how often or what milestones do I have uh, some government inspectors sign off so that I can move forward and, and have I had any setbacks in that regard? Um, in, in essence, the Australian Maritime Safety Survey inspection regime uh, is is reasonably detailed. However, the first one is a site inspection, which uh, I pass with flying colours. You know, love my tent. I think I think most uh, home built boats are built in chook sheds or out in the back of a paddock somewhere. Um, I actually have a factory where I'm able to keep my uh, materials stored dry, um, current, and uh, and secured. Obviously, with uh, with lock and key. Obviously, I've got some pretty expensive equipment, and I've got alarms and the works and cameras and the works on the whole site. So, that's an important uh, section of this whole thing is being having being in an area where I can physically lock the whole thing up and uh, and go about my day's business, uh, working in my kayaking business and my manufacturing. So, the second inspection uh, was uh, just after. I gel coated and, and uh, laid down the tie layer, the 300 CSM tie layers. Now I've done two layers there. He needed to inspect those and he did those actually uh, immediately after me doing them. And David uh, lives up in Sydney and he's a marine engineer and a qualified Australian Maritime Surveyor. And he came down and uh, made that inspection, which we passed with flying colours. And then the next inspection, which uh, which we we undertake, is is in the bulkhead tabbing. So very important, and and, and bulkheading is a, a critical feature of a, the structure of a boat. However, my hull is monocoque in its structure, so therefore it is a, a structural entity on its own. Um, without bulkheads, however, I certainly don't have any structure. So. Although it can support itself and it is designed to be a self-supporting structure, it certainly does need bulkheads. So the tabbing and the radiusing of the uh, of the adhesive and the bulkheads 
in particular is a very important uh, inspection and I'll be going through that very shortly. So um, the one thing that has come up, however, is because I've had to remove some of the foam out of the hull, uh, I've had to go back to the marine engineer, have them restructure it, and I, I think I showed this way back in episode 10 or something, I think it was episode 5 maybe, I don't know, I've lost track now. But removing the foam um, did actually require us to put in around about 8 more layers of 1200 quad. So that'll give you a bit of an idea as to the difference in uh, a foam core and a solid glass boat considering the weight and also the, uh, the thickness. So we've gone from 30 or 35 mil or 36 or 37 millimeters uh, down to around about seven or eight millimeters of solid glass. Now I do have to provide another sample of that particular laminate, particularly around the engine bays, which was the biggest problem there um, for destructive testing as I have made with the actual hull line. So it's, it's a similar section, however, it is a, a certainly a different laminate in that area there due to the fact that the foam's not there and it doesn't have the physical um, uh, compressive strength that, uh, that the foam would have, would have created. So um, yeah, interesting question, but the, the, to date there's been no setbacks. It is a costly uh, part of the build and it does cost a significant amount of money to have each inspection done. The reason why I'm doing it is not that I'm going to run a charter boat. However, uh, being a boat builder, I am keen to uh, to have it actually physically in survey uh, because you never know what things could present themselves into the future. And for me, that could be a, uh, putting that boat into charter in in Queensland in the Whit Sundays, or you know, I, I'm just leaving all my options open. But at the moment, we're just building a boat in survey, in Australian Maritime Safety Standards Survey, which is an Australia-wide uh, recognition. And it also will add uh, uh, very favourably to the resale value should I ever come to sell it, build another one. However, uh, there's no plans to do that yet, uh, but I have said that before. So um, I think we'll move on. So, so Mark, yes, uh, very interesting question. Um, Justin Lawrence in South Africa, he's, uh, he said, do I have any completed boat photos of uh, the boat that was actually built in my mould? Yes, I do. Uh, in fact, there's a number of photos, particularly the one, uh, the Powercat version that was bought out by Voyager Catamarans, uh, Derek Appleton up in Queensland. Um, he is the one that actually made... Uh, some fairly major modifications to the design. It's originally a, a Granger, Tony Granger design, um, and Peter O'Brien commissioned the boat to be built. Uh, but uh, Derek, that was the, the last owner of the boat or the mould, um, had all of the modules created for the inside, which obviously was going to speed up production and, and improve the uh, professionalism of the product. Uh, sadly, in around 2008, like most boat builders, uh, struck on hard times with the with the GFC and had to scale down, and uh, and that's why that mould became available to me, and that'll be answered a moment in a moment in the next question. So uh, I do have photos, and I'll pop a few up just now. Uh, there's a photo here of of the uh, the boat in construction in uh, the factory in Brisbane, or I think it was on the Gold Coast, it was near, uh, near the Gold Coast somewhere, which is just south of Brisbane uh, in Queensland, and there's a couple of photos here of it being demoulded. So yes, I do, I have a range of photos, and, and to be honest, I've, I'm, I'm basically clinging on to those 20 odd photos because that's, uh, that's giving me some real oomph to move forward and moving forward is is uh, is something that I just cannot afford not to do because I've got too much time and, and obviously money invested in the uh, in the whole deal so uh, interesting stuff so a dealer you now I'm not sure what you are a dealer of and I hope it's fiberglass or something but uh, do you have any plans to um, temporarily brace the bottom of the mold frame between the hulls uh, after positioning the truck or my big, my big truck, my beautiful truck underneath it before I lift it. Um, in fact, we did identify that that shape, that, that shape there, if I lifted it, would actually create a, um, a problem with it sagging and therefore it could damage the boat inside or in fact probably crack the mould in half again where I've already cut it down the hole, uh, down the centre line. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm under each support there will be an acro prop which has about a four ton um, rating on it and one of those each horizontally under each um, uh, frame 
and then I can still physically lift it because it will in fact go under the truck chassis. And I've answered that in a couple of the comments, but most of us don't get to see every comment. You know, we're pretty busy people. We're trying to uh, keep up with about 10 channels, but with my channel, definitely those, um, those Acra props are gonna be the answer. They will stop any chance of it collapsing inwards until I physically get the hull out, which is only gonna be about a 20 meter, or sorry, a 10 meter move before I can demold. So it's not really a huge risk, but it's certainly worth paying uh, two or 300 bucks for the four acro props to jam in there to physically uh, support the structure of the, the framework on the, on the mold. Good question, buddy. So honey force, not really sure what that means. <laughs> How, do you, how much do you expect the boat to weigh? Uh, currently, the, the last production version was eight tons dry and 10 tons. That's 8,000 kilos in Australia. I'm not really sure what it is in the US or, uh, or Canada. I'm oh, sorry, but mainly the US where you guys sort of are working on you know, different uh, weights and measures. But uh, trailering it, I'm hoping, uh, we've worked it out, it should be around about seven to seven and a half tons dry. So trailering it isn't really an issue. Um, I'm pretty lucky here that I'm not far from the water. In fact, uh, our town, uh, Huskisson, which is on the Jervis Bay waterway in, in New South Wales, just south of Sydney, uh, is a fairly prominent boat building area. However, we have no boat building uh, anymore. I'm pretty much the only guy. There's a couple of guys, a couple of us building small boats, but uh, mine would currently be the biggest, uh, or the only cat being built here. In fact, there's a few yachts being built in the, in the boat yard across the road. But uh, there is no yachting, uh, yacht building industry here anymore. We did have quite a successful um, business here some years ago. But as a result, uh, yeah, we have good facilities here. We don't have any way of really moving them around. That's the issue. Uh, cats are uh, a little bit difficult to move around. There's a, there is another trailer on the north side of the bay, around about, uh, probably about probably 40 minutes drive from here. And he is able to pull cats out of the water for anti fouling and, and servicing. So, um, the reason why I built this trailer is firstly because I have a number, and I'm, I'm talking probably around about 10 to 15 logistical moves I have to do to demold, move the mold, mold, um, move my boat in and out, obviously to put engines in, you know, and that, that dome tent that I have there is basically going to be the home of the boat. Once I demold the hull, the hull will go back into the tent and the mold will go elsewhere. So a lot of the questions I've been getting are, when am I going to demold? And a very interesting uh, point here is that you remember when I demold here, I'm gonna have two of these bastards to deal with and, and that means I've got to store an extra catamaran sized project, in fact, that's bigger than a catamaran, uh, somewhere else and that'll come at a significant cost. And you know, we're talking around about 4,000, three and a half to 4,000 dollars a year to store something like that here which is pretty cheap given where I am, but uh, you know, I've got some very good friends here that have got some good property. So um, I'm in a situation, however, where uh, I use my factory, our factory that I work out of with my business, with my kayak manufacturing, and the current situation I'm in now is, uh, is just the best I could possibly ask for. It is 500 meters from my home. It is about a kilometer from the nearest boat ramp, which is wide enough for me to launch my catamaran. In fact, the truck will be a launch vessel or a launch vehicle to launch with as well. We have a nice sloping uh, boat ramp. And, and in fact, I should be able to launch quite simply where I am given a high enough tide. And we do get some pretty high tides here. Our tide range is only around a meter or a meter and a half, but it does give me uh, a lot of options and I'll probably do it around about two o'clock in the morning and uh, on a massive high tide to save the embarrassment of uh, something going wrong. <laughs> I hope not, but it's still some time away, clearly. Um, it's also how far is the build site from the water, as I said, around about a kilometer. Uh, I only have about three corners to negotiate. So it's not like that truck's gonna be out on the highway doing 100 kilometers an hour or 60 mile an hour down a highway. It's only ever probably gonna to get to about two or three k's an hour. It'll probably take 20 minutes to get it down there. So luckily I shouldn't have to crane it into the water. Um, I'm trying to avoid that. However, it is a little bit difficult access down there and they're about to uh, put in some pretty big improvements down to our boat ramp, which is going to increase it again. We have, however, got a waterway that really is suitable to catamarans. Um, the river out in front of the uh, boat ramp down to Huskisson, which is the main tourist town here, 
that river is is quite shallow and there are no longer many yachts in there there's probably about 20 or 30 yacht keeled yachts there because uh, the average depth is around at two meters and most of them have a 1.8 meter keel so uh, we're finding a higher or a bigger number of cats in fact i think there's currently around 15 to 20 cats in our creek and where my mooring is i have a 43 leopard uh seawind 1160 and a number of other there's a crowder boat there there's a number of other seawind 1000s you know there's a number of cats around my little uh trailer sailor so i'm calling that cat alley for a very good reason and uh yeah, the popularity obviously because the water is shallow and even that mooring is only in one and a half metres of water. Uh, which brings me to the draft of the boat that I'm building. It's around about 80 centimetres, so it is a, a skegged cat. Uh, it has a, a skeg on it where, and it is a shaft drive uh, catamaran as well. It doesn't have sail drives. Um, the engine modules that I have or the engine, uh, engine room modules are designed to be used with a shaft. So uh, that again will reduce the, uh, the, the draft of my cat. Um, yeah, so essentially hopefully that's answered that. Um, he also mentioned here, Honey Force also mentioned here about getting out of the, uh, the block, <laughs> getting out of my tent. Um, we have worked it out. It's, uh, it's gonna be tight. It's gonna be a bit tight. But uh, I do have um, uh, a contingency and I can remove a couple of the uprights on the tent and suspend it up uh, and slide that hull out without having to pull the tent down. And in fact, if I get it out there and I have to uh, skull drag it with a backhoe, uh, I'll do whatever I need to do to get it out. Now to get it out of the gate, yeah, um, I did measure the gate and uh, I'll answer that in a moment. So. Hopefully I'm giving you a fairly fair insight as to what's going on and hopefully I'm not too, uh, it's not too boring for you guys. So, all right, so Tim Pierce, um, his question, how are you going to do the deck hull joint, a bolted flange with a cap? Um, uh, the deck and the hull joint is, a, uh, is going to be glued with plexus. Uh, there will be bolts in it initially to hold it together. Um, in fact, the hull and the deck mould already have holes in them uh, where they did bolt it together. However, I won't have the deck mould on the top. It's going to be the deck sitting on top. And, uh, and that flange will be glued together um, and then it will be glassed internally. So there'll be an internal flange um, uh, um, uh, section, of, I, I'm imagining around uh, 200 mil of of 600 double bias, probably two or three layers, all the way around the perimeter of the inside of the hull and deck, and uh, and therefore, and that plexus will form a a radius as well. So it'll have a fairly substantial join, but there's also a gunnel strip along the uh, along the the shear, and and ultimately, um, I I'm not hoping to have any sort of bolts or anything, but it's a small gunnel strip uh, which will hide the join. I hope, and then it'll obviously be fared into place uh, where that strip ends. So, yeah, I have actually given that some thought. So, pretty, um, pretty straightforward, really. It's just like seeing me in the other boat, and uh, you know, and hopefully it'll it'll all go together. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, are you going to have a sail? And if so, have I had any thoughts on the rig yet? Yeah, I've already uh, been quoted for a complete rig by uh, Chris at All Yacht Spars. Um, this is a, a major rigger here, or a major spa supplier in Australia. Um, I'm likely not to have it rigged here in Jervis Bay. I'm likely, once I get the boat on the water, I've done the first sea trials with uh, Hunter Motor, I'll uh, probably just, just career it up to Sydney. It's about a, an overnight trip to Sydney as a power cat. Take it up into the, what we call the pit water, which is up around where uh, Home and Away is filmed, if you ever watched that. Australian uh, drama and uh, they're quite a beautiful area, Kareel Bay, and uh, I have family that live up there, so I can sort of pull up and, and hopefully get it rigged there by a rigger in Sydney. So it's going to be professionally rigged. I won't be rigging it myself. I won't be, certainly won't be uh, undertaking building the, uh, the mast and, and doing all that. However, as I get further into it, I tend to enjoy these uh, sorts of challenges. Don't uh, ever say never. That's uh, that's my motto. I, I, I may undertake it, uh, but if it's going to be a matter of another six months' work, then certainly um, 
I figure it's worth paying Chris to just get the bloody job done. I am looking at some very interesting sail track arrangements from Carver, uh, which are just phenomenal pieces of gear that'll not only lighten it and, uh, and make it nice and uh, uh, maintenance free or, or as maintenance free as I could possibly get, but uh, we're talking that over as we speak. So, and then his final question is send me a wombat, or, or his comment is send me a wombat. I mean, we've got so many bloody wombats around here, mate. Oh, <laughs> they're, they're vehicle wreckers. You hit one of them, it's like hitting a boulder. So, you don't want a wombat, mate. And I don't even know where you are, Tim, but I imagine if you're in the States or somewhere, well, uh, you don't want wombats. They're like they're, they're like a pest on the road here and they are quite dangerous, uh, them and the bloody kangaroos. So, um, yeah, good question, though. I like it. Uh, I like a guy who puts an Aussie slant on his questions. All right, so Dan Charleston from South Carolina. Do you have any idea where you're able to buy? Why you were able to buy this mold from the previous owner? Now, this gets back to what I was saying earlier. Um, molds and boat building is a, a very changeable thing, and, and what happens is molds really have. Uh, very little value unless you've got someone like me who's prepared to take it on. So in a production sense or in a commercial sense, um, these molds and the tooling that I was uh, that I acquired and I acquired at reasonably priced, it was uh, you know and certainly a state of disrepair and needed some serious restoration. But um, it had sat for ten years and and we're talking well, actually I think it was about eight years. In fact, the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, or whenever it was, um, was to the major detriment of pretty much every boat builder in Australia and probably around the world. You know, you have, we had a lot of uh, boat builders go under over that time. Um, fortunately, the guy who owned ours is uh, is operating, certainly making smaller boats, and is making a comeback. So that's a, a pretty... Um, amazing story and he's a lovely bloke and I've actually met him a few times and and he makes a beautiful little 6.3 meter um, uh, fishing catamaran and he's just about to bring out a revamped uh, 9.3 meter cat and he's also I think he's also got a 10.9 meter one as well in fact I've seen the mold for that um, whether it's in production or not, uh, these are generally subbed out to someone like Haynes Hunter or someone in Australia here, where the, the boats are, the hulls are made, and then they're finished off by the by the uh, the owner of the business or you know his staff. So the good thing is that I was able to acquire it. it, it the original idea was that the fellow that had purchased it off um, the catamaran company that owned it, um, he was going to manufacture the kits, so do the wet parts, i.e., the hull, deck, the internal modules. Uh, the flybridge, the um, engine modules, all the insides, and, and essentially sell those components onto somebody as a as a uh, as a kit form. And I'm certainly keeping that in mind as a as a future option for me. Um, look, when you own the amount of tooling that I've got right now, um, you've got to keep all your options open. And I and I think really, um, I'd be foolish to. I'd be quite foolish to discount any options. So watch this space, I guess, because I might get to the end of it and think I never want to build another one. But however, I'm a boat builder and uh, and I do love a good challenge and I love a good opportunity. Uh, I'm not really convinced that there's a hell of a lot of money to be made in it given that there's a pretty big second-hand market over here. However, the prices are going through the roof for good quality second-hand boats. And, uh, and when you can produce a boat for what I'm producing mine for, then there certainly is a lot of options going forward. Um, there is a lot of expensive raw materials in these boats, but uh, if you were to break down the the physical raw materials in a boat, it would constitute around, probably I would guess around 35 to 40% of the cost of the craft, and then you've got electrics, and then you know probably around 40 to 45% of it, uh, or electrics and motors and things, and probably around 40 to 45 percent is labor. So that's one of the reasons why I'm doing it on my own because I'm tired ass. But no, no, it's not, not the reason why. It's just no one will help me. Quite frankly, uh, a lot of people are very, very uh, scared of working with this material. And, and, and fair enough too, you know, it can be pretty dangerous stuff. You've just got to have your, your wits about you and you've got to know your, your, uh, your limits with regard to, um, to uh, exposure to the VOCs and, you know, and styrene and, and the like. So. I am very, very careful. I try to always exercise good safety, but you know, sometimes 
uh, I've just got to have to lift something on my own. And, and you know, that, that puts me at risk and I've got a bit of a dicky back, which is a bit of a problem. So if I were to work out the materials costs uh, for this boat, in fact, I've, done, I've got spreadsheet uh, showing all this and I'm really not inclined to divulge it. However, you know, you'd, you'd be in the order of finishing the boat for around about 300 and something thousand Australian dollars. Um, that's a that would be a pretty reasonable estimate, and that's that's including rigging, sails, motors, um, hopefully electrics, um, and then the balance is effectively in in labour. So, uh, if you're not prepared to work hard and, and do it all yourself, then you know you're gonna have to pay someone a shitload of money to to build a boat for you because there's, there's a lot of labour. I mean, we're talking probably ten thousand hours. I guess I'll be putting into it on my own. So yeah, interesting stuff. Um, yeah, if anyone else is considering getting into it, like Dan's coin, um, suggested here, then you know, do your figures. Certainly, um, I'll tell you an interesting story a bit later on about that, <laughs> about doing your figures. All right, so Chuck Allen, uh, Chuck, when Chuck said uh, when you made the hull thicker, do you anticipate having problems with the other moulds lining up, especially when you put the top mould on? Now the deck mould. Um, I spent a great deal of time with, uh, with, with tape measures and lasers and, and the like, uh, ensuring that I pulled the hull mould in to suit the parameters of the deck mould. Now, remembering that this is fiberglass and it's only this thick and, and this is a, you know, an eight foot high hull side, um, there is a significant amount of flex. I mean, I can basically pull it six or eight inches either way um, once it's out of the mould without the bulkhead. So what I'm inclined to do is I'm not going to tab the top from around about the waterline to the, the gunnel edge. I'm not going to physically glass and tab that. However, I will tab below there and then certainly in the lower bulkheads will be in place so that when I do in fact cap the boat with the, with the deck mould in a, in a, um, in oh, possibly six or eight months time, um, I will then be able to make necessary adjustments to ensure that when I tab it, that I don't get a massive print through the hull and a big bow in it where the bulkhead's jamming into the side of it because I have to stretch it in. It's a trick that a lot of uh, professional boat builders use. They, um, they will sort of tab the final part of the bulkhead right just after they work out whether the hull's gonna or the deck's going to fit, and and you know and that's a, a good bit of an insurance policy for me. I think that's a, a little bit of a sensible thing. Um, I am a little bit restricted because I've got a lot of internal modules, and the good thing about having those modules is I'm already seeing, as you've seen in the last video, I'm already seeing stuff fitting in place. So, cross the money up to question seven. It's gonna be a one hour job this one. All right. Question eight, I seem to recall you once saying that the hull was designed to be laid up with, without foam core. Uh, will there be any issues with fitting the various modules? Look, I've dealt with this in a couple of, a couple of the recent videos or the earlier videos. Definitely, we had uh, some issues below the waterline where foam was installed and uh, the engine modules didn't fit. So it was really only the engine bays and the forward uh, starboard head that was an issue. So. Uh, I was able to counteract that with some good engineering and some obviously some solid glass laminate. So, uh, yeah, very, very uh, painstaking and annoying, but you know, that's that's boat building, I'm afraid. All right, Muzfuzz, are you going to move aboard and become a full time cruiser? Look, J Janet and myself uh, share a bit of a, a common dream. We, we do a lot of sailing. We sail, you know, at least probably once every fortnight. On our trailer sailor, we've got uh, a lot of people we know in the area here that have got cats and, and yachts, and uh, and we basically live on the water with our kayaking business. So yes, uh, full time cruising for us for a number of years really is on our agenda. However, um, you know you just never know what's going to come up and what is not going to come up. So you've just got to aim for it and uh, and aim high and keep moving forward. So the the mould itself, what happens to it once we're done? Mm, that is a matter of conjecture. I mean, I've, I've always got the option of building another one and possibly more. Um, that could be an issue uh, from a point of view of where I'm doing it. Uh, I may need to sort of find another suitable site. And to be honest, there's not many suitable sites in Australia now where you can build boats. So, you know, that's the reality, unless you've got a property somewhere with no neighbors. Um, you know, you've got to be, and I'm 
very, very careful about my dust emissions and my, my styrene emissions, etc. I, I don't, I try to impact on people as minimally as possible because, uh, you know, you, you don't want to impact on your neighbours if you can help it. Do I have any pictures and plans for the layout? I have a complete set of plans. I have a complete set of layout. And the other thing I do have is every single layout diagram for electrical, plumbing, air conditioning, gas fit out, lighting. Uh, I've got a complete electrical wiring diagram. Um, yeah, all of the modules, where they fit. I've pretty much got you know everything that ever existed for the boat. I was lucky to acquire everything in one foul swoop. And, and you know, it pays dividends because it, it, I think about 100% of the time I'm actually on the mole, I'm probably 50% of it I'm trying to work it out. The other 50% I'm doing it and standing back and work wondering whether I've done it right. And, and to, to date, I'll, I'll, I have to say, luckily I've made very little mistakes. What sort of equipment, electrical, solar inventory will I have on board? I intend to be fully self-sufficient. So solar, hopefully lithium batteries. I'm sure we're going to go with lithiums. Um, uh, as far as um, uh, uh, motors, I've got twin Yanmars with twin alternators on each uh, water maker I'll intend to put in it and, and obviously a, a decent generator. So completely self-sufficient is the key. The ecosystem has to be, uh, be self-sufficient or, or you know, you're going to be wanting and you're better off to just do it or allow the facility to put that in later on. So yeah, so good question, Muzzfuzz. Not really sure what a Muzzfuzz is, but uh, I'd like to know. So if you can let me know, that'd be great, mate. So Tim the Toolman, looks like Woolamire boat ramp is only about a kilometre away. Well, he's correct. Um, I think this fellow's getting on Google Earth. I think, I think it might have been even Tim that said, I can't see your catamaran mould on Google Earth yet. Well, luckily we haven't had an update around our area here. We have got a very interesting area. We have two naval bases within around about 10 kilometres of where I am, uh, which does restrict um, certain drones uh, and possibly, you know, because it is such a military area, we have a lot of fighter activity and a lot of, um, you know, warship activity around us as well. And it's a, it's a big place for naval manoeuvres um, you know, joint manoeuvres between the Kiwis and us and, and you know, in the US as well. So uh, maybe that's why Google hasn't updated. It is funny though, because when I bought the mould, I found it on Google Earth where it was sitting in Queensland um, and it has now disappeared. So whether that means they're now updating down the coast, I don't know. I'm about sort of probably 15, 16 hours away drive. So, you know, it's probably only about five minutes in a, in a satellite, but they certainly haven't updated it yet. But yeah, good on you, Tim. He's spying me. He's uh, he's keeping an eye on me. And when that mould shows up, mate, hopefully uh, hopefully the boat's finished by the time it gets in. So, Phantom Cat. So flipping the deck mould soon, would I be right in assuming when you get a crane in to do it, uh, you'd like to kill two birds with one stone and demold the hull at the same time? Uh, so in that instance, um, the crane is around about 250 to 300 bucks for uh, an hour and a half. It's only a franner, so it's only like an eight ton crane. And it is more than enough to do uh, the demolding, to flip the deck mold over. I've already lifted the deck mold with it, which is around about six tons. Uh, it, has, it is at the extent of the franner. However, uh, to roll it over, I'm certainly getting ready to flip that deck mould over and I have a second tent to go over the top of that. So, you know, it's a bloody logistical operation. Um, I would like to demould at the same time, uh, obviously to keep the franner here, but that day is going to be quite a logistical um, effort. It's, it's going to be a demould, move the whole mould, uh, around at 200 meters away where I'm going to intend to store it, then flip the whole mold, uh, flip the deck mold over, then put the hole back on the truck, put the truck back in the tent, um, and then yeah, it, it's yeah, that's going to be a big day. <laughs> I'm dreading that day. I'm, I'm hanging out and I'm dreading it, you know, because I, I certainly uh, won't be inviting a lot of people to that day because I'll be a little bit, a little bit of a stress bucket, uh, gee, a little bit, uh, a little bit edgy I believe and uh, yeah, everyone knows what I'm like when I'm edgy you don't come near me because I'm like a bastard. Um, Q&A my question would be uh, an order of operation so currently what the order of operation is going forward right now will be uh, the bulkheads will be tabbed in place I pretty much have all of the foam core bulkheads for the front um, or pretty much half of the boat done so I've got all the bulkheads done for the hull. All the floor sections are certainly, everything's sitting in place, it's not tabbed in yet. And I've done that for a reason because I'm making sure every single thing fits. 
Uh, I do have two plywood bulkheads that are going to go in and they're coming up in the future episodes. Of, uh, uh, I, I couldn't get away from using plywood. The survey, uh, uh, the surveyors wouldn't allow me to go away from a compressive bulkhead. So I've got a, a two plywood bulkheads um, that are the two lateral ones and then all of the other bo everything else in the in the boat is foam core so uh, of which i'm making the sheets myself so there's definitely a um a, a big process coming up so the bulkheads will go in and then i'll uh i'll uh, test my truck lift and then i'll hopefully be able to roll the whole thing out to uh, the other side of the of the uh, driveway demold it and then put the hull down somewhere i have got to make room for that and then uh, pull the gate out drive the mould across the road, bring the truck back once I've settled the whole mould in the right place, bring the truck back, use the crane, lift the hull back onto the truck, put the, the hull back in the tent, uh, so I'll have a nice gleaming white hull hopefully, um, hopefully with no imperfections in the hull, and then at the same time flip the deck mould over and get started on that. I can see that happening currently around about February. So there's no point in me trying to start laying up a deck right now because the average temperature inside these tents is around about 35 degrees and that's just way too hot to, uh, to, uh, to get you know, a good layup and, and, uh, and survive the event. Because <laughs> I was in the tent the other day at a 45 degree and far out, man. You just can't imagine how bad it was. It was possibly uh, one of the, the worst heat situations I've ever been in my life, but I just had to get the, done, get the job done. Um, yeah, so huge, huge order of events coming up, mate, coming up for sure. All right, so Jeff Keating, is the deck mould as much work as the hull or a lot thinner and quicker? Look, the beauty of the deck mould is that I don't have any bulkheads to form in it. It's uh, certainly not as thick, however, it does need reinforcement in certain sections. And there's also a, um, an issue with the window mullions because uh, with the windows, they, they don't just stick on the outside of the fiberglass. I have to rebate them in. So I, I have to kerf um, a material into the mold and then plasticine seam it radius it so that I get a rebated uh, surface so that once it's demolded and I pull that that material out, I have rebates for the polycarbonate um, main saloon windows and uh, and certainly down the side. So it's got it's got a quite a nice, impressive sort of window arrangement. Um, but uh, I do there will be quite a lot of uh, small, intricate work in that. However, that's all done before I spray up. And once I spray up, pretty much um, uh, certainly it's not as thick a layup. It is uh, only around about 20 mil maximum um, in areas, and there's some, even some 10 mil. I think there's uh, the actual rear cockpit has a 30 mil, and on the just on the saloon roof is 30 mil, obviously because we're walking around on it. Um, that's actually I'm not actually that worried about that. I'm more worried about the the physical um, uh, canopy that I've got to build on the on the top. I'm thinking about starting one totally from scratch because I do have a mould for a flybridge arrangement. Um, but I'm certainly going to use the outside perimeter of it, but I'll probably make a dummy one and then pull a mould off it and then start again. Or I'll just fashion one out of foam and, uh, and you know, make my own. So, yeah, good question. But uh, definitely will be quicker. I mean, I'm anticipating around, uh, around eight weeks to ten weeks to get the, the deck finished and then demoulding can happen pretty, pretty much straight away. Um, it is interesting, however, once I get that deck demolded um, I can't just sort of stick it on the boat that's that's just not going to happen because uh, firstly it's going to restrict a lot of movement within the boat so I anticipate um, levitating it around about six to seven feet above the hull on acro props and uh, hydraulic um, jacks and then I'll be able to go up and down up and down up and down and shave bulkheads because I you know there's no perfect bulkhead shape there's no physical template for that i've got to pretty much trim it off until i'll go up down up down up down up down and eventually i'll go bang lock it down in place and that'll be a big day because that's going to take three or four of us uh we'll be working at around 100 miles an hour to get that glued down bolted down clamped down all at one piece and i do have photographs of all this process so yeah good stuff all right flamethrower are there reinforced points for the chain plates. Now, this is a contentious issue. I actually have 
the plans for the original uh, boat, which was a cedar um, boat, and it had a chain plate on the center bulkhead. Uh, so that chain plate was a large stainless um, bar around 12 millimeters thick with about 50 holes in it, and then it actually goes through the deck. Um, I'm not a big fan of that idea because firstly it moves the shrouds into the walkway. Um, I'd like to have reasonable clearance for when you're walking down the down the deck towards the bow. Um, and secondly, it actually is just another leakage point. Um, however, I do like the idea of being able to physically stitch it into the bulkhead. And, and that's uh, the original plans allow for another uh, two layers of uh, fiberglass reinforced plywood and then holes and then it's physically stitched with Kevlar um, twine and glassed in place so that the chain plate can never leave the bulkhead. Um, I am however considering and I'm taking some advice from the marine engineer to uh, to have an external one that's mounted onto the side of the boat and then therefore you get better walkway clearage uh, clearance for str straddling up and down the, the deck and I, I have around about that much pathway but you know the last thing you want is a bloody shroud sticking right in your pathway um, but yeah at this stage um, I'm considering all options with that sort of thing. Um, is there a design for the mast and the spagnol rigger? Yes I've answered that already I've, I've got a, uh, a full quote and, and although it's not that cheap uh, certainly from an insurance point of view and from a survey point of view I, I'm, I really do need to uh, use a professional rigger because uh, you know this is obviously going to be an in-survey vessel um, my steering system, look, I'm, although I, I love sailing and I love the feel of the tiller, it will, it, it is likely to be hydraulic. Uh, I, I, I like the idea of the hydraulic because it certainly is easily repaired. Um, I haven't got a massive stainless cable or, or, or cable and some big uh, sextants in there swinging around, but, uh, you know, I'm open to anything and, and I am looking at currently at a couple of uh, very, very popular Australian made design uh, hydraulic steering systems. And the beauty of that is, um, is that you get very, very good steering. However, you lose a bit of feel in the rudder. So it's a trade-off, but it also, um, I'm looking at sort of redundancy and being able to repair it in the field uh, myself. And obviously, if I'm going to install it, then I should be able to repair it, shouldn't I? That's the whole idea of me building the boat because I can fix everything. All right, Tim Parr, the sequence going forward. Okay, so... Christ, I could spend two hours talking about this. This is going to be an hour long one at best. But uh, yeah, the sequence going forward for right now is obviously bulkheads and then uh, you know some tidying up. And then I'm going to remove all the modules out. All of the fiberglass modules will come out of the boat for demolding. So once I've got the bulkheads and the floors all in place and the fuel tanks, obviously, I'll then be able to physically lift it out because there's so much structure in there at that point that uh, I don't need the other things sort of, you know, adding extra weight and clouding it. I'll take them out and then I'll demold, obviously remove the mold, uh, put the hull, the brand new white shiny hull, hopefully, back in the tent and then I can start to uh, glass those modules in. Now, there's a question coming up here about the modules. Are they, how are they fitted? They are physically blocked glued, glassed, and seriously embedded into the uh, to the structure of the boat. Um, in fact, they do form, plus all the road partitions and bulkheads and doors and everything, they all form the structure of the boat. However, um, I could run at a bare minimum in there without the modules and just do my own furniture. Uh, I do actually like the layout, so it's my prerogative, it's my boat, and I'm sticking to it. I'm just going to use the modules that I have for this one. Uh, certainly if I did another one, and uh, after I've had a garden for a couple of years, maybe I'll change my mind. But currently I like the layout, it's certainly functional, and uh, and yeah, it's a pretty good looking thing, I reckon. So as you can see with those photos. So um, yeah, once the deck's demolded, the deck will go in up and down, up and down, up and down. Eventually I'll cap it, and by then I should have electrics and, uh, and, and all of that sort of um, dealt with. And, and then I move on to doing the uh, the top um, the top bimini the hard top on the on the roof of it and, and someone asked earlier on I'm asked about whether we have um, uh, mini curls or dagger boards. Currently the boat has a skeg that will form some stern tracking. Uh, however, it's not. A top end uh, racing performance catamaran in this thing. It, it does have, um, it, it obviously was a very, very powerful and, and excellent power cat, 
Uh, I think it did sail okay. I don't think it pointed very well. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, you know, ambivalent about all of that. I, I, I know that most of us motor and sail at the same time. I'd like to say that it's going to be a great sail cat. It's going to sail. All cats will sail. Whether or not it's going to, you know, get 17 knots on, on a beam reach is, is another question with slippage. But certainly that skeg and being a kayak designer, I see that that skeg will add certainly add some serious tracking to the boat. If anything, it will uh, reduce the weather cocking that you tend to get with these things. Uh, however, it might uh, reduce its ability to point uh, into the wind, so or, or at least climb into the wind, uh, so to speak. But you know, most cats are like that anyway, unless they've got a, a dagger ball that uh, you know, protrudes three feet into the, out of the hull. So yeah, uh, there's quite a sequence going forward. So Michael Warlick, uh, do the modules slide in or do they tie in and increase the stiffness of the hull? Just to answer that, yep, absolutely. They form a lot of stiffness. In fact, the laminates uh, uh, that I'm using for the, the modules will provide significant stiffness. And where there's voids, and in fact, where there's insides of wardrobes and things, that'll all be uh, probably foam cord panel rather than uh, you know waterproof MDF or, or plywood. I'm trying to avoid using any other wood other than the two main bulkheads, but uh, I'm trying to keep the weight down too, but the amount of structure that I have to put within the modules as well will certainly add to the, uh, to the rigidity and obviously um, you know, strength of the hull. So yeah, definitely increase the stiffness of the hull. The hull is actually not really a problem because it isn't a wide hull. It's not like a big lagoon or something. It's, it's, it's only about a metre wide. So, you know, it's not one and a half metres, two metres wide. So I don't have uh, a real need for that. It's more in the um, in the the solid feel of the boat. You know, there's nothing worse than being on a boat squeaks and groans and, and sort of flexes when you walk on the floors. So I've made the floor panels significantly uh, stronger than they probably need to be because, you know, I'm a big unit. <laughs> and I thump around the boat like a bloody fairy elephant. All right. 58 horsepower, Russell. Yeah, Russ, you didn't hear me correctly. I said 57. So, you know, if you want to split hairs. But, yeah, 58, you did hear right. I originally wanted 80s in it. Um, they did actually suggest that any that a 30 or a 57 would be, or 54, I think I was looking at Vetus at one stage and, uh, and end up buying Yanmars. But the 57 horsepower, what, what I came to this decision because I wanted something that had enough power to get it moving, but also something that wasn't going to labor at low rev. So obviously with a diesel, they like to sit at a slightly higher rev than a petrol engine should, and, uh, and obviously enjoy that, and they enjoy being driven. Um, but the problem with an 80 horsepower with the type of hull that I have, I think I'd end up with it laboring significantly, which will obviously lead to more fuel and oil usage so, and, and more wear and tear on the motor. So um, yeah, probably gone a little big. However, um, I want, if we're out there somewhere and I need to motor out of a, out of a system, I want to be able to get out of there as quick as I can without, uh, you know, planing. So it should be big enough. I'm also uh, buying Gorry um, counter-rotating uh, props. So, you know, it's being a stern drive, I'm mindful of the fact that there's significant drag with the props, but the props are bloody almost as expensive as the bloody motor. But uh, yeah, not quite. I, I'm, I'm sort of joking there. All right, Mark Jordan is a catalyst siphon in the fluid nozzle of my gun. Now, uh, back when I did the guns, that the big machine um, video, certainly my um, catalyst is mixed around about an inch from the nozzle tip and that has saved me I reckon I'm probably saved probably eight nine hundred liters of acetone simply in wash up certainly saved probably 50 60 liters minimum in in wasted resin that I would have cooked up a batch and that's gone hard before I've got time to get it down that gun is uh, is incredible uh, it, it absolutely it is it is the bane of my life and 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 that sort of gear you know when you're dealing with stuff at high pressure um you've got to keep it well maintained and you know it's, it's so easy just to come home and and not you know break the thing down and clean it out but you know luckily i don't have to clean the thing every day i tend to clean it every couple of weeks i give it a good flush with acetone uh, and that's mainly just to stop any sort of deposits around the seals on the main shaft but you know it's it's a sort of thing I, I used to serve as breathing apparatus and scuba gear and stuff for a living and you know compressors and things and and really it's it's just part and parcel of owning equipment and and yeah it's it's reasonable reasonably high pressure 
Um, it runs at around about four bar, so you know the, the gel coat's pressurised, but it, it is just an absolutely phenomenal piece of gear. And I'm, I'm so glad I bought it. It was worth the investment, and simply I couldn't have done it without it. All right, so uh, C. Lee Shannon, I need some good filtered ventilation in that spray booth. Now my spray booth is not a spray booth. Um, it is a, a an area. It's, it's sort of like the underneath of a deck with uh, with about eight cafe blinds that sort of seal it, so to speak. Uh, I do have a very good extraction fan in it. Uh, you probably can't hear it because I'm putting trap music over the top of the, the video, but um, it is running extraction there. I do have a filter on the extractor. Um, it certainly probably could be a little bit bigger, but you know, I'm not in there all the time. And to be honest, the expense and everything, uh, you know, I've just got to be careful about that. I don't wet the floors down. However, when I lay, we're not because because there would be a humidity problem, and that's one thing I'm very very concerned about with um, with laminating is is uh, obviously the catalyzing and humidity can be a real problem. If you have too much moisture around, uh, you, you're going to get really incorrect catalyzing, and and you know the whole job will be a shocker. So I uh, certainly wetting the floor down will bring things down to the ground very quickly, but uh, I don't really need to. Honestly, I'm not doing enough of it to uh, to warrant that. I have seen factories where they've got grates on the floor and water running underneath the floor, obviously to remove the, the particle and the um, and the overspray and the like, but uh, not in my case. So Vinny in the US, why no exhaust fan in the spray room? That takes care of most of the overspray and keeps the air clean. There is one there, mate. It's just probably not capable with the amount of material I'm putting down. Um, Look, that day I did the two modules uh, at once. I'll never do it again. That was that was just epic that day. And uh, and having a couple of gun problems, man, I was like, <laughs> what you saw uh, of my temperament was not a true indication of my um, of my uh, actual state of mind that day. If you had a heard me about an hour before, in fact, someone made a comment that I should do an outtake of uh, of my uh, my stuff ups because. Uh, I'm getting very good at editing myself down because my uh, my partner and my wife Janet, I, th I think I think my mother-in-law is watching, so I've got to be a little bit careful. And there's a number of kids I know, uh, Teal and uh, Lynn, over on um, onboard lifestyle. I hope uh, young M's not watching me <laughs> with my profanity. So I'm always I'm starting to be a little bit more mindful about it. Although it is the blood, sweat, swearing, and tears of building a a catamaran. So you know if you don't like a bit of profanity, you better sort of turn me down because I, I I tend to like a little bit of a swear. I, I'm uh, especially when I'm you know reached my limit like I did that day. So Vinny, yeah. Um, it, I'm doing the best I can with what I've got and I'm not going to spend a million bucks to put in a spray booth when I'm making five modules, you know, that's that simple. All right, let's move on here. Um, oh, Rick, Rick Laporte, and this guy's a champion. He's in uh, in Canada and you should check out his uh, his boat. He's building this beautiful little trawler. It's it's called the um, MV Shecon. It's an absolutely beautiful looking trawler and he's done the fiberglass hull himself. He's, uh, you know, check out his channel. In fact, if you uh, look him up, I'll uh, I'll put a link just up here for uh, for Rick. He's a he's a great guy, Rick. He's a lovely bloke and uh, ex Canadian Coast Guard, so you know he's been around the traps. And uh, and yeah, have a look at his channel because um, you know he's only very much at, at the stage that I'm at. But you know, and he, and and obviously you guys in Canada, you have winter to deal with. Winter is my time to shine. I get more done in winter because I'm not dying of heat exhaustion. But uh, you guys just basically got six foot of snow to get to your job. I don't have that issue. I mean, it's never snowed where I live and, uh, and never will. You know, we're basically in a temperate environment here. But yeah, Rick's a great guy. Uh, follows everything we do and I follow his channel as well. And, and in fact, um, uh, you know, the first person to comment often is Rick, particularly on Facebook. We catch up a bit and uh, yeah, really top bloke. So check him out, Rick Laporte. And uh, I'll just put a link here to his boat build. Check him out. He's a he's a top fella, and you know, a couple of hundred of you go over to him, and and, and you know, give him some uh, give him some encouragement because you know he's got to get out of that dirty winter that you guys get over there. I don't know how you get out of bed in the morning when you got to face that snow every day. Far out, just murder. So catch you later, Rick. So R E Hill, the modules. How many layers? What type of cloth? And in what order, please? Right out. So uh, they are gel coat. They're two layers of 300, which means that I don't get any print through to the gel coat. And this is, I'm, I'm using polyester on these modules, uh, not vinyl ester because they're not immersed in water. And uh, and then I put a, a 600 double bias or a 600 um, 
uh, 45-45 orientation uh, double bicep, another layer of 300. And then in areas where needed, I'll put uh, 10 or 20 mil foam. So underneath, for instance, under a stair tread, there'll be a 20 mil foam, and then another layer of 300, another layer of 600, another layer of 300, just around those areas. Particularly on corners like stairs where it goes like that, um, I see a lot of production boats where you, when you're stomping down stairs, they're stress cracking. You want to reinforce anywhere around those areas. And I usually whack a nice little tape of 1200 quad around those areas there just to beef that up. You don't want to go any heavier, but you certainly can't go too light. You're going to be dealing with spider cracking for the rest of your life. And how many boats I've got down the river here that I just look at them and the poor buggers are dealing with endless spider cracking. I'm not saying I'm not going to get it myself, but I'm trying to counteract that now. And I know at the bottom of stairs, I'm trying to reinforce them in particular. Another place uh, which is um, very important is, is around the bed uh, bases where you know people tend to sit and and read or whatever, you know, those are areas that just need to be reinforced. And everything that's going to have any downward load on it will have 10 to 20 mil of H80 foam, and I've got oodles of the stuff, so I'm putting that everywhere on my um, on my module. So yeah, pretty much uh, 300, 300, 600, 300 foam, 300, 600, 300 to finish it off and peel ply. You want to peel ply so that when you stick your hand in a cupboard, you don't rip your freaking arm off. There's nothing worse than a production boat. You stick your hand in a cupboard and you get a gash of a razor sharp shard of glass that's hanging out like this. You know, that, that just irks me, that stuff. You know, it's just simple lack of effort to finish. And uh, yeah, so yeah, plenty going on with uh, modules. There's a lot of uh, reinforcing I need to do. And in fact, they're only at a very minimal layer at the moment just to get them into the boat. All right, wood wrapping the moulds. Oh, crazy 11,000. That sounds like. I'm sort of sci-fi. Um, what would wrapping the moulds in shrink wrap uh, like they see boats wrapped up with work for protection of the moulds? Look, I, th I think the problem with wrapping them is um, in an area that doesn't get high or heavy, intense sun, uh, possibly would work. However, if you wrap a car in a tarpaulin in the Australian sun, there's a good chance the paint's going to chip off it and stick to the tarp. I'm not going to do that. Gel code has a UV inhibitor in it. Um, provided I've given it a good buff and a polish, I can stick them outside. I try to keep them out of that intense afternoon sun from midday to four o'clock here is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm covered in skin cancers. I'm 51 years old and I'm, next week I'm going in to get this bastard cut out of me. You know, this is what it is to be an Aussie. We just get stuff burnt. I've already had five cut off, burnt off in the last months, you know, so uh, fact of life in Australia, the sun's intense, we have very little ozone layer in it, and ultimately um, uh, it's just a brutal sun that we have, so you're better off just letting your, letting your gel coat sit there just like you would a boat on the mooring and, uh, and put a bit of effort, you know, put in a day's work to restore it if I want to rejuvenate the mould. Um, I'm not prepared to pay like 600 bucks a square metre a week to store a bloody, you know, or a month to store a, um, a mould that's going to get used once every five years. Uh, I'd rather just restore them all. So I think I covered that earlier on anyway. All right, Ron Fish, love the videos. Just wondered how you, how, have I measured the gates to take the boat through? Oh, mate, <laughs> it fits through in two separate pieces. Not really sure, um, yeah, why I didn't think of that. But no, one of the uh, one of the gate uprights is going to have to be lowered to get it in and out, get the mould out, and then secondly, to get the boat out when the time comes. I have got a second issue as well as the, the driveway's about that steep to a flat road, and uh, getting it down is going to be an issue. I might have to get around 30 tonne of road base or something and chuck it in the driveway and level it out, uh, take the boat out, and then hire a backhoe to put the road base somewhere. And, you know, road base comes pretty cheap here, so it'll be worth it so I don't rip my rudders off when I drive out. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about, but definitely. Um, uh, definitely a long way away, as you said there, mate, but it, it, it certainly is an issue. But taking a gate post out really is nothing. All right, for the Q&A, DP Rider 02. Uh, I seem to recall you once saying the hull was designed to be laid up with foam core. Will there be, or has there been any issues of fitting the various modules? Now the spaces were designed and built to be uh, slightly reduced by the addition of foam. Yeah, covered that a few times. Definitely um, not a huge issue now. It was a bloody issue when I first did it, but uh, uh, I'm sort of over that, and I'm, I'm thinking in those terms. Now, the deck itself, when it goes on, um, the foam goes to within 150 mil of the actual edge, and it's solid glass, so they will meet 
as two pieces of solid glass, not as two chunks of foam because you need the rebate to make sure that you've got no air bubbles and then I can put a, a beautiful flange of, um, of uh, you know, 600, 1200 and a few layers of glass all the way around the internal seam uh, and glass it properly and peel ply everything because when you peel ply you don't get burrs and rub and, and it's, it's simply easier to fair and paint if you're going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to be doing a lot of fairing and painting. It's one of the banes of my life. I hate it and uh, I'm more likely to put internal trim and make up flat sheet of gel coated fiberglass for my uh, some of my panels and then I'll uh, you know obviously get an upholsterer or I'll upholster it with, with vinyl or, or some sort of PVC uh, sort of decking I guess or internal lining boards. So Chuck Allen at Ross I noticed you did a lot of improving of the original specs along the way when you made the hole thicker do you anticipate having problems with other moulds lining up especially when you put the top mould on uh, talked about that earlier, um, obviously the foam issues in the hull weren't huge but we dealt with that but uh, and once again when the deck and the hull join uh, there is a, a void about 80 mil on each each side which allows for a 150 mil seam so um, fortunately I've sort of given that a lot of thought before I actually started laying up and in fact the engineer requires to have solid glass on the laminate so there's no chance of that foam delaminating on the edges so um, yeah I don't anticipate a lot of problems I, I did some massive amount of measurements and uh, and uh, and the like but again there's enough flexibility in the hull and the deck to uh, hopefully get the thing uh, strapped together before I then go and glue it down but yeah once again I'm going to be going up down up down up down and uh, yeah I covered that earlier on so Chuck thanks for your question buddy so that brings uh, this Q&A to an end guys um, Thanks for the questions. There's probably another couple of hundred questions that I've received over the, the, the previous year that I just didn't get to. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question, but I sort of picked out the, the last more relevant ones that were uh, sort of targeting the area that I'm dealing with right now. But there's obviously room and scope for a, another q and I just don't know whether you could handle another hour, but I think you're probably asking for that hour back to your life. You know, you want that, <laughs> want that hour back that I've just endured watching me uh, jab on but at the end of the day I've given you uh, you know as much information as I could possibly give you in an hour um, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty more so thanks for joining me guys and uh, make a comment give it a like don't forget to subscribe and check out those other channels you know Onboard Lifestyle ah, they're fabulous Teal and, uh, and Lynn and, and Young Emma and, and also Rick Laporte and check him out because uh, you want to see a guy with some perseverance I think it's been going on for about seven years his build and, uh, you know, we want to see that thing in the water, Rick. We've got to see it in the water, bro, just like you want to see mine. So let's, let's get on to it and, uh, and subscribe to them as well. You know, even if you stop watching me and subscribe to them, because they're great people and, and you're going to get some great techniques and stuff like that for, for uh, fit out and, uh, and obviously build. And, and, you know, we're all in this together. Even you guys watching are in it with me. So thanks, guys, and uh, thanks for your time. And, uh, and I'll catch you next time on Life on the Mole.